So uh, I've been asked to speak about on a topic by my good friend, Dr. Bansi Sabu on uh, metabolic control before elective surgery. So we are not talking of the patient who's having intravenous insulin while in, uh, as, as an inpatient or in ICU or anything like that. This is all before. This is not when the patient is having surgery or is in hospital. So the, 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 there's a lot of confusion because you see a lot of people feel that blood sugar has to be controlled before sugar, any surgery takes place. And therefore, it is imperative that we know what targets are, why we have to control, and how we control. Now, diabetes in surgery are interlinked. Most patients, I think one in three people who have surgery in Indian hospitals have diabetes. Um, and most of them are type 2 diabetes. And very few are type 1 diabetes. Patients with diabetes are known to have an increased perioperative morbidity and mortality. Morbidity in the form of increased risk of post-operative infection, they're at risk of arrhythmia, kidney disease, paralytic ileus, uh, stroke, myocardial ischemia, and increased length of hospital stay, and even death. On average, diabetes patients will require more hospitalization, longer duration of stay, and will cost more to manage than patients who do not have diabetes. So, why is this? Because there's a massive metabolic response to surgery. The trauma associated with surgery is just, uh, leads to increased stress hormones like catecholamines and cortisol, which increase insulin, uh, reduce insulin uh, uh, sensitivity. And this depends on the severity of the operation or any post-operative complications or any pre-operative comorbidity that the patient might be having. In addition, if you have heightened sympathetic activity, which you would expect when somebody is having surgery, there is reduction of insulin secretion, while there is also additionally increased growth hormone and glucagon secretion, which further worsens the plasma glucose levels. Further, when patient has surgery, there is catabolism. We know that patients who have surgery on gen in general, uh, abdominal surgery leads to about five kilos of weight loss. And this loss is mainly muscle and bone loss that people have when they have surgery. And this abnormal situation leads to increased gluconeogenesis, increased glycogenolysis, breakdown of proteins and fat, and ketogenesis which can lead to hyperglycemia and ketosis. So this is what happens during surgery. This is what we are up against. And therefore, we have to be very careful about how we prepare a patient for surgery. Most anesthetic agents cause hyperglycemia, but remember, anesthesia is a quick on, quick off process. So this does not affect glucose metabolism tremendously. Epidural anesthesia does not increase catecholamine release or cortisol release, and therefore blood sugar levels are not affected in epidural anesthesia. Now, it's very interesting to look at perioperative hyperglycemia. This is before the event has taken place and risk of adverse events. And this is surgical patient support. This is a retrospective study by Dr. Inzuchi's group. Um, sorry, I did a lie, Dr. Umpires's group. And this is the surgical patients, about 40,000 patients, 33,000 without diabetes, 7,000 with diabetes. And they go through this process where they have blood glucose performed or not performed. And if they have a blood glucose performed and their blood glucose is more than 180, they either receive insulin or they not, do not receive insulin, whether they are diabetic or non-diabetic. Now, this is what the left-hand side, the flow diagram shows you. But if you look at the right-hand side, you will be surprised to note that where my pointer is at this point of time, the composite adverse events, cardiac events, non-cardiac adverse events and death is far higher in patients without diabetes who have hyperglycemia than in patients who have diabetes and uh, have hyperglycemia. So it seems that hyperglycemia is worse when detected in non-diabetic patients than when patients with diabetes. This might be various reasons why the primary reasons that springs to mind 
is that the stress levels obviously are so high in the non-diabetic patients that they are causing a hypoglycemia. And therefore, this is one of the reasons why there are far more adverse events in the patients without diabetes. And therefore, for non-diabetic patients, but, non -di but not diabetes patients, the risk of adverse events is linked to hypoglycemia. This underlies the paradoxical effect maybe due to underuse of insulin, but also that hypoglycemia indicates higher levels of stress, as I was just telling you, in patients with no diabetes than in patients with diabetes. Now, with this in mind, this is the background information. I will take you through, through a few cases. These are a few cases which I have seen in the last couple of weeks, and these are all related to surgery. And this is not a commentary on anybody. This is not a commentary on any surgical speciality. This is not a comment on any doctor in particular. But I'm sure all of you who are participating in this discussion, who are watching, who are chairpersons, who are actually uh, being a part of act, uh, clinical medicine, you will all agree that this is something that we see very commonly in our day-to-day -day practice. And you will also wonder whether this is fair or not, and I will show you evidence to suggest whether it is fair or not. So this is a 56-year-old male. He's uh, got a busy corporate job, but he's having problems with his vision. So he's taken two weeks off for planned cataract surgery. He's on metformin, one gram OD, all stable, A1C 7%, which was done 15 days ago. He arrives at the hospital for FICO emulsification, he has a random blood glucose test because he's already had tea and biscuits in the house in the morning. His random CBG is 194. The ophthalmologist and people there in the department announced that because he has a CBG of more than 160, his operation is cancelled. Fact, this is not an exaggeration. This happens every day in our day-to-day -day practice. I'll take you to another patient. This is a 78-year-old lady. This lady has been under my care for a long time. She takes bias 30, 22, and 10. I have never been able to increase her morning dose of insulin much because she is prone to hypos before lunch. And for me, it is of paramount importance that she does not get any hypoglycemia before lunch. Now, she has bad osteoarthritis and she's planned for a bilateral TKR. Just because she's going to have a TKR and she lives alone, her son who works in the United States comes with three weeks leave, short time present, that she needs to be having some kind of help at home and in hospital prior to when she has the surgery. She has some pre-op tests two days prior to the surgery, fasting 103, PP 232, A1C 8.1%. I get a letter from the anesthetist who has done a pre-op check saying that this patient's PP sugar needs to be below 180 and HbA1c needs to be less than 6.5% before they can be taken up for surgery. Now, as needless to say, the operation is cancelled again. And this gentleman has come down from the United States with a three-week leave, and he will have to go back without having his mother operated. Now, the mother is left in a situation where she can go for surgery on her own. Imagine she's 78 years of age, or she has to wait for one year when the son will get a leave again, or the son has to really risk his job and career and try and take leave again when the HbA1c is down and come down for surgery. We move to case three. This is a 55-year-old woman. She has menorrhagia and she's got a large uterine fibroid. She's well controlled, I think, on dapomet and citamet. But then when her blood test results come back, her HbA1c is 9.6% and her hemoglobin is 7.5. That again, she's referred to me. This is the first time I'm seeing her that she should return when her A1c is 6.5 because her operation is being cancelled because of poor glycemic control. Is this right? Is this wrong? We need to look at the evidence. Whenever 
we are faced with a clinical conundrum, the way to go forward is to find out what the evidence, what the guidelines are telling us. So this is from a book by the ADA published in June 2022. This is an ADA publication, and let us see what that tells us. Many studies have looked at the association with HbA1c and surgical outcomes, and whether elevated HbA1c is linked to poor postoperative outcomes is not known, but what it does show is just a marker of poor periodic operative glucose control. Besides, there is no evidence proving better outcomes by deferring the surgery for better control. This is American Diabetic Association. And though there is no fixed HbA1c, there's only reason to cancel an elective surgery only if the HbA1c is more than 10%. Procedures that are of emergent or time-sensitive nature, as in all the three patients that I showed you, the focus should be to get the patient in, have the operation, and provide good inpatient glycemic control. Even the anesthetists, the anesthetic college, this is from the British Journal of Anesthesia, says that adverse outcomes, but there is lack of data to show any kind of benefit by delaying the surgery to correct the A1C. This is from Joint Royal College of Physicians, Royal College of Surgery, Royal College of Anesthesia, Royal College of Ophthalmologists, Royal College of, Anesthesia, uh, of Gynecology and Obstetrics. And though there is very good reason to actually refer the patients and make sure that there's a plan of surgery, again, the most important thing is the place that I have circled out for you. Their HbA1c is only if the eight. HbA1c is 8.5%, refer to a diabetologist, otherwise proceed to surgery. Again, if you look at places where HbA1c is not readily available, again, you know, you, when a patient comes to the hospital, like the patient did, with a random blood glucose of 194 awaiting a cataract surgery, what does the Royal College of Surgeons and the American College of Surgeons, this is of course from the American College of Surgery, what do they say? Consider cancelling non-emergency procedures if the pres patient presents with metabolic abnormalities like diabetic ketoacidosis or honk or blood glucose readings above 400 to 500 milligrams per deciliter. So all these patients who have had their surgery cancelled had no reason to have their surgery cancelled because it would not affect the outcomes. And in fact, particular to cataract surgery, we have data from India that if people who have gone through surgery for cataract, you know, most about 200 patients with poor glycemic control on admission who underwent cataract surgery did not show any vision threatening complications and there was no influence of preoperative serum glucose levels and final visual outcomes. Now, it is a tendency for us Indian doctors to say that, you know, this is Western data. So there is no Indian data. Indians would fare in a miserable way if their blood glucose is elevated. This is data from India published by Penke et al. showing that it has no effect on surgery. In fact, the Cochrane Review, which is a completely unbiased review, says that preoperative medical testing, including plasma glucose check, did not reduce the risk of medical adverse events during or after cataract surgery, when compared to selective or no testing. And as you can see, this is high certainty evidence. So there is no reason to cancel or worry about glycemic control unless the blood sugars are really, really high in patients who are due to go for surgery. So the goals, on the other hand, should be to reduce the patient's morbidity and mortality by making sure that their other conditions are dealt with avoiding hyper or hypoglycemia, maintaining proper balance of acid, base, electrolyte, providing adequate fluids. And once the patient is admitted, try and get the patient's blood glucose levels less than 180 milligrams per deciliter. The general principles preoperative are not to cancel surgery, but to optimize OAD, start insulin if necessary, add a basal insulin with OAD, there is emerging evidence with very good results 
particularly with TPP4 inhibitors, metformin, SGNT2 inhibitors, and metformin, and basal addition will provide excellent control in these patients. We go for basal bolus if there is too much of a concern. Regular SMBG for all these people who are being prepared for surgery. Avoidance of hypoglycemia, monitoring of renal function and electrolytes and blood pressure control are of paparatamount importance. But if I've managed to make one point throughout this presentation, I would like to put it to you, ladies and gentlemen. The important thing is do not cancel surgery on flippant and callous reasons as the patient has a random sugar, which is slightly elevated or a HbA1c of 8 to 9%. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.